You are promoting your new film, Helicopter Eli, in which you play an overprotective mother coming to terms with having to let go. Are you just dramatising your own life here? Probably. <laughs> Um, I, I would say it's a little exaggeration, but I, it's something that I think every mother goes through. And uh, Ela is pretty much typical of every Indian mother uh, from time immemorial. So we've been helicopter moms forever and we probably will be helicopter moms for the next 200, 300 years. I don't see that changing in the future. But I think uh, when your kids grow up, I mean, there's the a scene in the film where he turns around and he's like, you know, I, I'm your full world. You know, I'm your whole world. What about this? You have to find out who you are. And she's like, but I've been, that's all I do. What, what will I do if I'm not your mom? Yeah. And uh, you know that's her dilemma, but but you identify with her because you realize that everything that she does stems just from this intense love that she has for him. So if she's making a bed, then it's because I love you. If she's playing, then it's because I love you. If she's going to check on him, it's because I love you. So, but you have, of course, admitted on several occasions that you are an overprotective mother yourself as well. Definitely, I think every mother is overprotective. Yeah. I think uh, children are the one thing that you cannot fail at. You can fail at a lot of things. In life, your career, your marriage, and still handle that with a certain amount of dignity and grace. But I think when you fail your kids, it's something that uh, it's it's very difficult to take in, get over, or even come to terms with. You know, you've said that becoming a mother made you more tolerant. Your kids in certain you, ways. In certain ways. Intolerant in certain ways as well. <laughs> You've also said that it taught you patience as yeah. well, that you were actually, you, you didn't like meeting people 15 years ago. I still don't. But you, you're a little bit... <laughs> I'm better. You're better, yes. you're better. Yes, yes. What is it about children or, or motherhood that, that makes you more sensitive to maybe those others around you? I, I think I'm more than sensitive, it's just a question of perspective. Because when your kids uh, it's like somebody walks into the house and you don't particularly like that person. But your kids turn around and they're very normal and they actually turn around and they're like, you know, sitting and chatting and you realize, you know, actually maybe I was over Im exaggerating that problem and that person in my head and maybe he or, she, he or she is not as bad as I thought. And you know, hey, if it's a temporary issue and I just have to have a cup of coffee with them, it's not so bad. <laughs> so, yeah. So, how many times have your kids proved you wrong then? I, I mean. Oh, infinite number of yeah. times. An infinite number of times. They do it to me every day. They literally. And there are some days that I do it to them as well. <laughs> it's like, see, I told you not to talk to them so nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so those nuances that you've experienced yourself over the last 15, 16 years, I mean, how, have, how many of those contributed to the characterization of Ela? Uh, Ela was pretty much written the way it is. I mean, we haven't really changed that much from the script because the script was of this uh, overprotective, obsessive OCD mom who can't look beyond her son. Her son is like her be all, end all. Sun rises, sets everything in him. And uh, so, no, we have not changed uh, pretty much what that character is. But yes, of course, Pradeep Sarkar has uh, directed the film and uh, Riddhi Sen has played my son in the film. So I, both of them are such fabulous, uh, um, uh, you know, sources of information that way that, uh, you know, both of them have done so much to bring out Ela's character. Little, little nuances, little, little characterizations, expressions here, there. So, yeah, we've worked it. You know, we talk about mothers in South Asia and their kind of overprotective nature, but in a wider context, motherhood, uh, molly coddling your children to a certain extent is problematic as well. You know, we talk a lot about masculinity and toxic masculinity in today's day and age. Um, is there a problem with the way South Asian mothers are bringing up their sons? Ah, uh, you know, honestly, it's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. And um, most of the guys that you meet are wonderful guys. They're really, really wonderful people and they're wonderful men. And uh, they've grown up okay. And somewhere down the line, I think they figure out that, you know, they, they figure it out for themselves. So I don't know whether it's such so much of an issue per se, but hey, it would be nice if we could teach our sons how to cook yeah. and clean along with our, <laughs> along with our daughters. And uh, yes, molly coddling is there, but I mean, that's, 
I'm sorry, that's not going to change. Forget it. <laughs> like, I'm molly coddling my kids. I'm, maybe not to that extent, but yes, I am like full taking advantage of them while they're young and to coddle them, to kiss them, hug them, you know, and just generally take care of them. But isn't that the difference, right? When you say it, you say your kids, but there are some mothers who treat their sons differently to their daughters, uh, and that's where you have differences in society, that's where you have gender discrimination taking place as well. What is it about this place of the sun, so to speak, that's so kind of put you on know, a pedestal? I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna switch topics and I'm gonna take a tangent off that, but I'm gonna tell you something that, I'm gonna tell you an incident that happened. Uh, my son actually turned around and uh, told me, you know, like, mom, you know, I, I, why do you have to go for work? And uh, he, he's been asking me this question since he was quite young till since he was about two two and a half and I always tell him that you know baby I'm going to work see you enjoy going to uh, going to the playground I don't stop you but I'm going to work so I'm going to my playground so you don't stop me <laughs> so he's like okay he got the logic of that and till he till um, I think about about four months back he asked me this question and I don't know what happened to me but I turned around and I told him you know why I'm going to work I'm going to work so that when you grow up you're going to get married and you're going to look at women and you're going to realize that the woman who goes to work is just another normal thing in your life. It is not a phenomena. It is nothing to stand up against. It is just another regular feature of your life. Yeah. And you are going to look at women differently and you're going to appreciate them for all that they stand up for and all that they do. So I'm going to work so that my son and my daughter will realize that it is regular, it is natural, it is normal that women are supposed to be doing this, that we, we are going to be standing up and we are going to be taking our place in society as productive earning members of society as well. I think that's a wonderful way of looking at it and a wonderful, wonderful way of actually instilling those morals in your children as well. But what's not regular is choosing your career at 16, 17 and then being in it for 26 years. Definitely not regular. No, it's not. <laughs> You know, what I want to know, have you in any way relived or lived the childhood that you might not have had through your children? Uh, in a way, yes. In a way, yes. Um, you, you know, recently, like, like about maybe six, seven years back, I had a whole uh, fashion blow up, I would say. So everybody turned around and it was like, oh my God, you're making fashionable choices. You've <laughs> changed your sense of dress. But that was one of the things that I never went through yeah. as a teenager. You know, I never had that time because I was 16 years old and I was in the film industry and everybody was handing me clothes and telling me what to wear and this is how your makeup should be, this is how your clothes should be, this is what you should be wearing. I never developed an opinion on what I liked or I didn't like. Yeah. You know, it was it would just never happened to me. It's <laughs> not rocket science. It can't be that difficult. I mean, if my 13 year old daughter and my 14 year old my 14 year old daughter is doing it my 7 year old son is doing it it i that ha i have to have an opinion on it so i sat down i researched i went through a whole gamut of things that i wanted to wear didn't want to wear i tried out 120 things and okay now i've come to a nice comfortable place in my head at least where i know what i like what i don't like but that was a part of my childhood that i missed completely yeah. it yeah. just i just skipped over it because of the fact of you were working that, yeah i was working of course, yeah of course. you know you went off on a tangent so i will as well when you went through that whole little fashion kind blow of up. blow up <laughs> um you have a lot of fashionable best friends as well right so when you called up manish malotra you called up karen johar and said hey guys i need a bit of fashion advice were they surprised at that point were they like you know, I did. this is not gadget i didn't call anybody oh, up you didn't? i didn't i didn't call anybody up because I knew that if I called any up anybody up or if I um, you know asked for advice it would be a crutch right. because I am so lazy that it would have become a crutch at some point in time so I kind of hired a stylist I and she was not very well known either yeah. and uh, you know I kind of sat down with her worked it through with her and uh, you know we kind of worked together for a while and I needed to do that. I needed to figure out who I was, make a few mistakes, stumble, fall and uh, yeah, get up and figure out my way around it. You know, uh, you mentioned that you were lazy then and you I know, still am. Well, I was going to come on to this <laughs> L word, lazy, because uh, Gajo, you are undeniably, undoubtedly one of the best Hindi film actresses of all time, yet compared to your peers, you've done the least number of films. Yes. And you say that's because you're lazy. I am lazy, I am picky, I am choosy, I am, uh, uh, I think it's a part, a part of my a life, not the whole of my life. And uh, the fact of the matter is that I really like my life. I like my whole, I like my husband, I like my family, I like my kids, I like going out for vacations with them, I like uh, chilling at home with them. So I, I like my life the way it is. And 
and uh, if I do a film, it should be because I really, really want to do it. It shouldn't be because I'm doing it just or because I have nothing better to do. That's not a reason to do a movie. You were always an actress who had an opinion, who had a certain perspective on and issues. And I've just gotten more opinionated with time. <laughs> well, what I want to know is, you know, you were working in a time where the majority of scripts were misogynistic, where the major majority of representations of women um, had some sort of negative traits to them. Was that part of your reason for being so selective? Did you turn many roles down because you didn't think there was a good representation of women? I wouldn't know whether it was a good representation of women, but I definitely didn't like the way, I, I wouldn't, I didn't want to do characters. Like, like for instance, there was this, uh, I, I was doing this one movie and I, I turned around and I was like, you know, I just don't feel like this. I just, I, I don't believe in her character. I don't, I don't believe in what she's saying. She just sounds like a ditz to me. I am so not doing this. So yeah, there was, there were reasons for me not doing characters because I was like, I don't want to play a character that I don't like. Of course. I don't want to play a character that I don't believe in. And if she's going to spout lines like, oh God, what will I do without you? That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, also then, you have played a mass murderer in Gupt. You've played a sister taking revenge for her, her, her raped and, and murdered sister in Bushman. Yeah. You've played a cancer patient in We Are Family. You've played a woman who, who kills a terrorist in Fanar. Did you know you were doing so much for diversity in films when you were doing these roles? I mean, Not was, at all. No? <laughs> no. I go by, um, I, I go by scripts. So it, it has to be a superbly tight script. It has to be something that uh, I haven't done before. I, I wasn't really taking diversity and I wasn't taking public opinion into account. Yeah. Uh, and I was not looking at it from a, you know, that broader perspective. I was just doing things that I liked and uh, that I believed in and that I could make work. Right, but you have used the word feminist yes. uh, off screen. Yes. You know, you posted on Instagram a picture of your great grandmother and your grandmother and you said that these two women taught you feminism without using that word itself. Ever. What, what was it or what is it about that word that you think scares people so much because people still do take a step back when they hear an actress use the word feminism you know I think feminism this is my definition of feminism feminism is being confident in yourself is being confident in your femininity it is not about standing up and bashing the other person down. It is not about putting people down to be stronger in who you are. Feminism is about that. And feminism isn't about, uh, you know, bringing people up and pulling people up and saying, I'm a feminist and you're wrong. It's not about that. It's about being strong enough to stand around and say, it's about being strong enough to, to stand and be respected for who you are. That to me is feminism and my, my grandmother and my great grandmother for that matter were absolute complete feminists. My great grandmother would sit, chill, have two drinks in the afternoon, have her lunch, go to sleep, knew exactly what was happening in the house without ever leaving the room. My grandmother cooked ran the house, drove me up and down without a driver all the way to Panchkani which is six and a half hours. I don't know whether anybody knows I went, I was in boarding school and she would drive up, pick me up on Friday evening, drive to Pune and with because my mother was working at that point of time, keep me over the weekend, drive back with me, drop me there and then come back at the age of 65. Wow. She drove her own car till she was 86 years old, lived alone in Lonavla, you know, ran to the, uh, ran to the market, drove to the market uh, for groceries and stuff like that. That is who she was. Wow. That is who she was without ever singly ever coming up to me and oh poor me, you know, I'm so alone or you know, why don't you give me a driver or you know, I need a help over here, helper over here, nothing. I mean, that is who I have in front of me. Like, that is feminism to me. That is true feminism to me. Was it being brought up by powerful, empowered women like that that made you more confident or certainly more able to stand your ground in the film industry? And I'm talking here about um, the way you looked because, you know, you didn't conform. You that were... was just because I was just plain stubborn and lazy. What about, like, the eyebrow? <laughs> I mean, the eyebrow is the one eyebrow of the things. Thing is, the eyebrow thing is just plain, like, I will only take a certain amount of pain. Right. It's as simple as that. <laughs> It is, it's because only people a think it's a sign of empowerment. It is empowerment. <laughs> it is empowerment because I refuse to suffer that pain unnecessarily, people. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's my my that's my contribution to women's empowerment. I am I'm not gonna do my eyebrows. You recently did an interview where you said that there is too many expectations of actors to be perfect at all times. Yes, yes. What do you mean by that? 
Um, I mean that. I mean that there is the social media has kind of blown up in your face, and uh, there are paparazzi all over, and everybody is uh, you know clicking pictures of you. It has become like ridiculous. If you want to go out for a regular cup of coffee, or if you want to go to the gym, it has become you know who who which brand are you wearing before you go to the gym, or you know before you go out for a cup of coffee, you just can't step out. And if you do, it's not even you can't. If you do by chance, you're trolled. You're are uh, critiqued you're uh, judged and uh, you know there are a hundred people who turn around and tell you oh you have no fashion sense you have this you have that and also oh, badly dressed and worst dressed of the week what is that yeah. I mean it is it is ridiculous to even have a statement like that it's like saying that we are not normal people or that we are not human but you know when somebody thinks of Kajol, they think of somebody who's thick skinned, they think of somebody who isn't affected by other people's opinions. I mean, I you... honestly am thick skinned and that has been there from childhood. Yeah. So I've kind of developed almost like the height of a rhino by the end of it. But at the end of it, you do get it. You're understanding, you're, you do get this information, whether you allow it to affect you or don't affect you, that is up to you. But you do get the information. It's still thrown at you. It's still like ridiculous it's ridiculous I mean the thought behind it is ridiculous the people who are speaking it are ridiculous when they say all these things and honestly speaking let's be like very clear about it you pick up a normal person and how many people dr dress a hundred percent all the time yeah or are have got perfect makeup and eyelashes on all the time not even on news channels am I talking about that so yeah. I mean yeah you know um talking about that and talking about celebrity culture, does that, knowing that, knowing that pressure, make you worry for your daughter at all? Because, you know, whether or not she chooses to be an actress remains to be seen, that's by the by, but she will always be in the spotlight. There will always be a certain level of scrutiny. I mean, the last time we met, we spoke about Sri Devi, it was before, it was, we, we had celebrated her 50 years in movies at that time, yeah. um, and we'd spoken about her, but her daughter's about to make her debut, and yeah. the press are just going for her, you know, how she dresses, how she looks, what she wears, where she goes, who she's with. Yeah. Do not those kind of uh, pressures make you worry for your own daughter? Uh, yes, of course, that does trouble me when I think about my own daughter and she has gone through a lot of uh, you know, complete nonsense for no rhyme or reason. You know, she's gone out with her friends or something like that, and people are following her, and she has to have security when she goes out in Bombay, etc. And uh, you know, I've had people stop her at airports and stuff like that to, you know, kind of, oh yeah, you know, let's click a picture and stuff like that. And she gets hassled and it upsets her. And um, I, and of course, I I do worry about that, but that is something that, like I tell her, it is one of the it's it's one of the side effects. Um, the bonus of it is that you can travel to London whenever you feel like it, <laughs> uh, first class, and uh, not worry too much about it. So I feel it kind of, I, it's somewhere balanced out. At least that's what I keep telling her, that it's balanced out. Do you think that she would be scared to kind of walk that path of fame because of those pressures? I definitely think she would be nervous. Yeah. She would definitely, would, it would affect her if, uh, if and when she did choose to uh, come into the film industry. But you have said that you would support her if she chose to. Definitely, you know, not you two would ways be there about for it. Her. Um, you know, you said that your mother also offered you a kind of ultimatum when you chose to do films. You said that she said, once you're in it, you're in it for the long run. You know, there's yeah. no two ways about it. You can't yeah. dip your toes in and then decide something else. See, that, that's, that's where the world has changed today, right. where I think that, uh, where I don't think it's like that anymore. I think that you can dip your toes in and, uh, you know, do something else at the end of the day because that's where the world is today and that's where, uh, that's where, your, where, where the social media has helped you so much that if you want to do something else, you can. You know, you, you can find an alternative career as whatever, but you can find an alternative career and still have a productive life. You know, we were talking about your roles and your films and the reasons for choosing those a little earlier. Something's just come to me. It was, um, I was watching an interview with Karan Johar the other day and he was decoding a scene from Kuch Kuch Hota Hai. So he was I decoding... I that interview, but Okay, yeah. so he was literally decoding the scene where Anjali walks onto the football pitch and everybody's laughing at her because she's decided to wear those fluorescent coloured uh, yeah. clothes and, and Rahul holds Tina's hand and, and all of that. Um, and, and really, that film, that role has been criticised. Anjali's role has been criticised because people think well why did she have to grow her hair and wear flowing chiffon saris to find the love and acceptance of a man well how do you look back at that role now I look back that I look back at it and I still think that Anjali as a tomboy was just so super cool 
<laughs> I loved her. I loved her. I mean, I'm not worried about who's criticizing what, but I just loved her. I thought she was just so so super cool. I loved her clothes. I loved her hair. I loved her hair bands. I just I I thought that she was so cool. She was so me. Yeah. And as far as uh, you know, her uh, you know, growing up wearing a sari and whatever, whatever. I mean, that's here and now. At that point of time, it was just an entertaining movie that we were making. So hey, don't get so deep into it. Over the last 10 years, you found your voice as a philanthropist as well. You know, you've done a lot of work away from movies in, in improving society for the betterment of, of various organizations. Um, one of the causes you support is actually for widows. Yes. Uh, it's the Lumba Trust that yes. you're a patron for. Why was that a cause that you felt passionately about? Uh, that was a cause that I felt passionately about for the simple reason that I just felt that that is something and they are I mean I feel that uh, there are lots of places where uh, women uh, you know have not they, they, they have no choice there is no choice left to them and uh, in our society as such when you think about widows there is a certain uh, there is a certain um, I don't know how there's certain social prejudice against that particular uh, against that particular notion that uh, that is just and it's horrible to live with and of course there is the financial issue with it attached to it and uh, where you feel that you know uh, how how does one you feel almost as as a I'm I touch wood god willing that will never happen but I mean generally you feel like in that sense that you know what am I going to do what next how am I going to survive it's a question of survival sure. it's really just a question of survival so if I could do anything to help them at that point of time yes I, w I st stepped forward for that do you think that causes such as the the Lumba Trust, which you're a patron for, or even the Help a, Re uh, Help Help a Child, Child Reach, Reach 5, five yes. initiative that you uh, join hands with the UN for as well? Um, do you think that being a celebrity, do you think a voice is enough? Do you think, because you've actually gone out in the field and yeah. worked with children, I mean, coming on to the, the sanitization project that you've worked on, you've actually gone out, you've spent time grassroots level. Um, not many actresses do that. <laughs> Um, that's something that I think I definitely wanted to be a part of because I, I looked at the statistics and they showed me these huge list of statistics about, uh, you know, uh, about children dying and which are the countries which have the worst statistics. And India had one of the highest statistics. And uh, the reasons for it were, I mean, like nearly 50% of it was, more than 50% of it was from diarrhea and pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And I remember having my baby and at that point in time I remember thinking when my baby was really small I remember thinking that oh my god my baby's got loose motions you know and I would go and take her to the doctor and she's got diarrhea and my doctor would t turn around and tell me you know just calm down it's not a big deal you know just calm down it's just diarrhea and I'd be like okay take care it's just diarrhea but when you think of such a large percentage of children dying because of it that is what actually got to me I was like but it's it's a question of hygiene it's a and it's a simple but effective method of washing your hands with soap and water if if I can affect one person to change around, if I can save one life, I will have done my job. It's as it's really, really that thought. And I also feel the fact that I'm a celebrity and I'm standing here and I'm talking about it does make a difference. Because I feel that when people look at you, they recognize you. They associate themselves with you. They say that, okay, this is somebody that we trust. Somewhere down the line, we trust and like this person. Therefore, whatever he or she is saying must have some sort of truth to it. And okay, and they're more, uh, they're more um, willing to turn their perspective around yeah. and look at something a little more differently just because you're saying it. I want to conclude by talking about your most recent achievement, which is being immortalized in wax at <laughs> Madame Tussauds. And you know, you're laughing about it, but it's a huge achievement for any artist, for any uh, performer to have that sort of recognition is a massive, massive deal. Uh, what was your first reaction when you stood in front of that wax statue? What was going through your mind? When I actually stood in front of that wax statue, I was like, good job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember as a child, I came when I was 11 years old, my mom and me came to London when I was about 11 years old. And I remember going to Madame Tussauds at that time. And I remember standing next to Hitler. And I remember standing next to Napoleon. Napoleon was like, awesome. And I was like, mom, we have to click a picture with Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte. And we have to click a picture with Michael Jackson. And I remember as a kid being so excited about that fact. 
that you know I was standing here and I could click a picture with every one of them and uh, I, and to explain that same sense of awe to my kids was a little difficult because they're like you know mom I can photoshop whoever I want next to me <laughs> why would I want to actually go and you know click a picture with them so I was like no baby you have to understand these are these are like you know to be included in these kind of people is is a huge it's a huge big deal absolutely yeah so yes i was i was a little awestruck by my own statue i'd say <laughs> you mentioned clicking selfies there um what many people might not know is that you hated taking pictures with fans about 20 years ago and how uh, you would <laughs> in fact you would actually turn fans away and say don't want to take a picture yeah. but that's changed a lot that i mean has. Uh, what what is the reason for that change? Um, I just became a little calmer about it. I just became a little calmer about it, and I realized that if I, somewhere down the line, I realized, like I said, you know, when my kids look at it, you know, uh, my kids somewhere down the line just gave me a little bit of perspective to say it's it's not so bad. <laughs> it's really not so bad, and uh, you know, if that makes them happy, and if that can uh, you know make somebody's day. It was it was not such a big deal. It was really not. And up to a certain extent, I'm okay with it. Up to a certain extent, till today, I'm like, yeah. And not when it's too early in the morning, not without my cup of coffee in my hand, or I'm running around with my kids or something like that, or I'm in the middle of lunch. No, but yes, otherwise, I'm a little better with it now. Amazing, Kajol. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.